Good morning. It is time for our midweek Bible study again. We are still in the book of Genesis, of course. This morning we're going to be taking a look at chapter 41, Dreams Again. Uh, of course, we've seen Joseph already go through uh, the, the, the uh, difficulties of being thrown into prison. There he met uh, the Pharaoh's cup bearer and chief baker, who both had dreams that Joseph interpreted, interpreted correctly, as it turns out, of course. And remember his uh, request of the cupbearer was, hey, when you get out of prison, because you're going to get out, um, remember me to Pharaoh so that I might get out of prison also. And uh, that's where chapter 40 kind of leaves off. The cupbearer and the baker have been released. The baker, of course, we know is hanged uh, for his crimes, whatever his crimes against Pharaoh were. The cupbearer is restored to his office, but promptly forgets about Joseph. And so, so we pick it up. <laughs> In Genesis chapter 41, starting at verse 1, let me read to you from this. I'm going to read down through about verse 8, and then uh, we'll have a moment of prayer, and we'll begin our study this morning. After two whole years, Pharaoh dreamed that he was standing by the Nile, and behold, there came up out of the Nile seven cows, attractive and plump, and they fed in the reed grass, and behold, seven other cows, ugly and thin, came up out of the Nile after them and stood by the other cows on the bank of the Nile. And the ugly, thin cows ate up the seven attractive, plump cows. And Pharaoh awoke. And he fell asleep and dreamed a second time. And behold, seven ears of grain, plump and good, were growing on one stalk. And behold, after them sprouted seven ears, thin and blighted by the east wind. And the thin ears swallowed up the seven plump, full ears. And Pharaoh awoke. And behold, it was a dream. So in the morning, his spirit was troubled, and he sent and called for all the magicians of Egypt and all its wise men. Pharaoh told them his dreams, but there was none who could interpret them to Pharaoh. <clears throat> Father, we pause as always, and we ask you, Lord, to help us as we try to understand, try our best to understand exactly what you intend for us to know here. Father, that we might learn its lessons and that we might apply them in our lives today. So help us, Lord, as we look into your word today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Two whole years, and, and the, the text is plain. Um, this I don't even think this was a day short of two years. <clears throat> Joseph has been in prison two additional years. The cupbearer and the, the baker were released. Cupbearer back to his former position, baker to be hanged. Two years during which time the cupbearer was supposed to remember Joseph and didn't. Two years of captivity added to the years already spent in slavery and captivity. And you almost have to wonder, you know, and if you're Joseph, it's kind of like, Lord, why me? Why here? Why now? Why, why do I have to wait? <clears throat> we'll answer that in a minute. Um, but at the right time, and, and that's the key, at the right time, God sends two dreams to Pharaoh. He dreams of two sets of cows. The first set, seven cows, it says, uh, plump and attractive. In other words, well-fed, uh, you know, meat on the hoof, uh, that come up out of the Nile and are eating amongst the reed grass there, that are subsequently swallowed up by seven thin and ugly cows. Um, you know, the the you know, hide hanging off the bones kind of cow, that there's no meat there. <clears throat> and then, of course, we see the, the follow-on dream. After Pharaoh awakens from that and then falls back asleep, there's a second dream that Pharaoh has. And in this dream, uh, he has seven ears of grain, it says, you know, that are uh, good and plump ears of grain that are subsequently swallowed up by seven thin and blighted ears of grain. And Pharaoh is troubled. <clears throat> Remember, dreams mean something. Um, and in this culture, especially, uh, every dream had the, the potential of having deep meaning. Um, now, I'm not saying God doesn't use dreams anymore. Uh, I, I believe he can still send dreams upon men, uh, upon women to, to enlighten us. But I, I don't necessarily believe that every dream has deep meaning. <clears throat> not in the way that this culture did. 
But for Pharaoh, these dreams did have meaning, and he wanted to know what they meant. So he called all the magicians, all the wise men together, and said, hey, tell me what these dreams mean. And all of them look at him and go, mm, I don't know. They don't want to say something wrong, because if they say something wrong, they'll be killed. So rather than say something wrong, they say nothing at all. <sighs> Fat cows and skinny cows, full ears of grain and blighted ears of grain. The reality is God has sent these dreams to Pharaoh on purpose at this time. <clears throat> Pharaoh, of course, is troubled. It says in his spirit, none of the men that he wants to, you know, tell him what these dreams mean can actually do so. And then we pick it up in verse nine. Then the chief cup bearer said to Pharaoh, I remember my offenses today. When Pharaoh was angry with his servants and put me and the chief baker in custody in the house of the captain of the guard, we dreamed on the same night, he and I, each having a dream with its own interpretation. A young Hebrew was there with us, a servant of the captain of the guard. When we told him, he interpreted our dreams to us, giving an interpretation to each man according to his dream. And as he interpreted to us, so it came about. I was restored to my office and the chief baker was hanged. <clears throat> Suddenly, <laughs> back to the mind of the cupbearer. And I'm sure Pharaoh is bewailing his status. You know, king of Egypt, the ultimate ruler, the man who held the power and the authority of life and death over every single individual in, in the country of Egypt. And he couldn't get one wise man to tell him what his dreams meant. And he may have even had a little bit of a rant at that point at his magicians and wise men. And suddenly, to the mind of the cupbearer, it comes back. That young Hebrew, he interpreted our dreams. And so he tells Pharaoh. Two years after being freed, he remembers Joseph. Now, we might look down upon the cupbearer and say, you know, what a horrible person to, to, to forget for two years. In truth, though, I believe God has superintended over all of this. God fully intended for Joseph to, to still be a, a servant, the overseer of the prison warden's house for those two years. Still a slave, still a prisoner. No elevation beyond that. He kept Joseph there on purpose until the cupbearer could be reminded at the right time when the right person had dreamed the right dream. We pick it up in verse 14. Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph, and they quickly brought him out of the pit. And when he had shaved himself and changed his clothes, he came in before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, I have had a dream, and there is no one who can interpret it. I have heard it said of you that when you hear a dream, you can interpret it. Joseph answered Pharaoh, it is not in me. God will give Pharaoh a favorable answer. Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Behold, in my dream I was standing on the banks of the Nile. Seven cows, plump and attractive, came up out of the Nile and fed in the reed grass. Seven other cows came up after them, poor and very ugly, and thin, such as I had never seen in all the land of Egypt. And the thin, ugly cows ate up the first seven plump cows. But when they had eaten them, no one would have known that they had eaten them, for they were still as ugly as at the beginning. Then I awoke. I also saw in my dream seven ears growing on one stalk, full and good, Seven ears withered, thin, and blighted by the east wind sprouted after them, and the thin ears swallowed up the seven good ears. And I told it to the magicians, but there was no one who could explain it to me. <clears throat> so Pharaoh calls for Joseph. Joseph prepares himself. It says, you know, shaves and puts on a fresh set of clothes. I mean, after all, he's going to see the Pharaoh, the, the ruler of Egypt. And so he prepares for his audience, and he appears before Pharaoh. And Pharaoh says, oh, you're this young Hebrew. I've heard it said that you can interpret one's dreams. And Joseph's answer points right back to Joseph's faith. The interpretation of a dream is not a power that Joseph has. It is something that God gives. The interpre interpretation of the dream is from God because it is God who has sent the dreams. That's Joseph's position on all of this. And that comes clearly through this as, as Joseph tells Pharaoh. It's not in me. 
So, you know, don't think that I'm going to give you some interpretation. My God is going to give you the interpretation. And Pharaoh accepts this answer. And I remember, of course, uh, the culture of the day that even the pagans uh, were essentially multi-theistic. Um, they certainly were not monotheistic. They were polytheistic. And so to have another God uh, introduced into the mix for Pharaoh was no big deal. And he even shares a few more details. Remember, he, you know, we didn't hear the first account of the dreams that after the thin cows had eaten the plump cows that you, know, you couldn't tell that there was no difference, that they were still thin and ugly. Um, but Pharaoh shares that with Joseph. Uh, again, a, a detail. And so Pharaoh accepts this answer from Joseph saying, well, this will come from God, not, not from me personally. And so we pick it up in verse 25. Then Joseph said to Pharaoh, the dreams of Pharaoh are one. God has revealed to Pharaoh what he is about to do. The seven good cows are seven years, and the seven good ears are seven years. The dreams are one. The seven lean and ugly cows that come, came up after them are seven years, and the seven empty ears blighted by the east wind are also seven years of famine. It is as I told Pharaoh. God has shown Pharaoh what he is about to do. There will come seven years of great plenty throughout all the land of Egypt. But after them, there will arise seven years of famine and all the plenty will be forgotten in the land of Egypt. The famine will consume the land and the plenty will be unknown in the land by reason of the famine that will follow, for it will be very severe. And the doubling of Pharaoh's dream means that the thing is fixed by God and God will shortly bring it about. Now, therefore, let Pharaoh select a discerning and wise man and set him over the land of Egypt. Let Pharaoh proceed to appoint overseers over the land and take one fifth of the produce of the land of Egypt during the seven plentiful years. And let them gather all the food of these good years that are coming and store up grain under the authority of Pharaoh for food in the cities and let them keep it. That food shall be a reserve for the land against the seven years of famine that are to occur in the land of Of Egypt so that the land may not perish through the famine. There you go, Pharaoh. It's a warning. God is telling you what he is about to do. The doubling of the dream, the seven cows and the seven grains of, of, of or seven uh, shoots of grain are simply a method by which God is telling you this is fixed. This is going to happen and it's going to happen soon. <clears throat> Egypt will know seven years of bountiful prosperity the crops are going to come in like crazy for seven years. But then there are going to be seven years of famine. And all of that bountiful crop is going to be gone. It's not even going to be remembered. It'll be as if it wasn't even there. Now we should pause here, I think, and ask a significant question. Why would God warn a pagan king of impending doom? I think the answer is simple. God is providing the means for his people, Israel, to be saved. Remember, Joseph's family, uh, the sons of Israel, are going to need a place to live that will isolate them and protect them. They will need sustenance and order for them to be able to multiply into the nation that God desires. You see, what Israel needs at this point to grow into the nation that God desires them to become is an incubator. And Canaan is not that place. The warring tribes and factions within the land of Canaan would decimate the sons of Israel before they ever got a chance to become big enough to become a nation of their own. And so God had to prepare a place for the nation of Israel to reside inside a bubble, as it were, that would protect them, that would allow the nation to flourish, that would allow, allow the nation to multiply into a true nation rather than just the sons of Israel and their families. So God had to prepare a place, but God also had to prepare a man. And as we find out, Joseph is 30 years old at this point. God has taken 30 years of Joseph's life to prepare him, to put him into the position of overseer of 
the prison warden's household, where he might interpret the dreams of a cupbearer and a baker. Even after waiting two years, then to be brought before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams, so that Pharaoh would do what God wanted him to do. That's why God would warn a pagan king. We pick it up in verse 37. This proposal pleased Pharaoh and all his servants. Uh, now, I, I have to stop right here, okay? Um, if Pharaoh's happy, all the servants are going to be happy, okay? So when it says, this pleased Pharaoh and all his servants, it's kind of a, a way of saying, uh, yeah, all the servants are going to be, you know, Pharaoh says, hey, this is a good thing. There probably weren't too many people within Pharaoh's entourage that were going to look him in the eye and say, oh, this sounds bad. No, you're right. Oh, yes, Pharaoh, this is absolutely the best thing ever. <laughs> and Pharaoh said to his servants, can we find a man like this? In whom is the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, Since God has shown you all this, there is none so discerning and wise as you. You shall be over my house, and all my people shall order themselves as you command. Only as regards the throne will I be greater than you. And Pharaoh said to Joseph, See, I have set you over all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh took his signet ring from his hand and put it on Joseph's hand and clothed him in garments of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him ride in his second chariot. And they called out before him, Bow the knee. Thus he set him over all the land of Egypt. Moreover, Pharaoh said to Joseph, I am Pharaoh. And without your consent, no one shall lift up hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name Zaphanath Paneah. And he gave him in marriage Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On. So Joseph went out over the land of Egypt. Time and place, person and purpose. There is always something at play here in God's plan. Nothing happens by accident in God's plan. Pharaoh is pleased. He's finally got an interpretation of the dreams. And it's an interpretation that is beneficial. Uh, I mean, it's, hey, you're going to have seven great years of crops, but then you're going to have seven years of famine, so you better prepare. I, I mean, if I knew I was going to have seven wonderful years of return on investment, and I'd pour everything I could into those investments to make as much as possible to offset the coming seven years when investments would fail. Who wouldn't? And so Pharaoh says, you know what? It's a good plan. Sounds wonderful. And since you're the one that had the interpretation and you're the one that has the spirit of God within you, I don't know anybody better to do this than you. And suddenly... The boy who was sold into slavery by his brothers, brought to Egypt by a caravan of Midianite traders, sold to the house of Potiphar, where he arose to become the overseer of Potiphar's household, thrown into prison unjustly as he was accused of, of a crime he didn't commit by Potiphar's wife, re, raised, raised up there to the position of overseer of the warden's household, to where he could interpret the dreams of a cupbearer and a baker that two years after the cupbearer could be released, he would be called before Pharaoh to interpret Pharaoh's dreams so that he could be elevated to the second most powerful position in all of Egypt. Purpose and place and time and person all together, all perfectly arranged so that Joseph could be elevated to this position. Pharaoh says, who better to lead this effort than you, Joseph? You must be the most wise and discerning man around, seeing as how you're the one who interpreted my dreams. You see, God has perfectly positioned his pieces upon the chessboard of life. Uh, Joseph is appointed overseer of Egypt. Pharaoh declares that no one will have more authority than him except Pharaoh. No one, he says, will even lift a hand or a foot unless Joseph says it's okay. <clears throat> you know, I... I used to say, uh, you know, again, when I was uh, in the Navy serving as a command master chief, 
obviously I wasn't the king. Uh, the commanding officer could be declared the king of you know their domain. Um, but if you can't be the king, it's really good to have the ear of the king. Joseph has the ear of the king. And Joseph has been granted the authority of the king in all matters except the throne. Joseph has progressed from being sold into slavery, overseer of Potiphar's household, still a slave, overseer of the prison, still a slave, overseer of Egypt, no longer a slave. Um, in fact, there are those who proceed before the chariot of Joseph and remind the people, bow the knee, just as they would to Pharaoh. Uh, we conclude the, the chapter here with these final verses. Joseph was 30 years old when he entered into the service of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And Joseph went out from the presence of Pharaoh and went through all the land of Egypt. During the seven plentiful years, the earth produced abundantly, and he gathered up all the food of these seven years, which occurred in the land of Egypt, and he put the food in the cities. He put in every city the food from the fields around it, and Joseph stored up grain in great abundance, like the sand of the sea, until he ceased to measure it, for it could not be measured. Before the year of famine came, two sons were born to Joseph. Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bore them to him. Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh, for he said, God has made me forget all my hardship and all my father's house. The name of the second he called Ephraim, for God has made me fruitful in the land of my affliction. The seven years of plenty that occurred in the land of Egypt came to an end, and the seven years of famine began to come, as Joseph had said. There was famine in all the lands, but in all the land of Egypt, there was bread. When all the land of Egypt was famished, the people cried to Pharaoh for bread. Pharaoh said to all the Egyptians, go to Joseph. What he says to do, do. So when the famine had spread over all the land, Joseph opened all the storehouses and sold to the Egyptians. For the famine was severe in the land of Egypt. Moreover, all the earth came to Egypt to Joseph to buy grain because the famine was severe over all the earth. So Joseph is given a wife at 30 years of age. He, she bears him two sons. Both of these sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, will inherit a part of uh, Israel's blessing. Uh, they will become two of the tribes of, of Israel. That's why there is not a tribe of Joseph. Instead, there are two tribes, tribes of Manasseh and Ephraim, that draw their lineage back through Joseph. And Joseph oversees the preparations for the coming famine. So efficiently, it says, that eventually he stops even counting how much grain they have in reserve because it just the number just doesn't mean anything anymore. He's so efficient that when the famine spreads to surrounding regions, Egypt becomes the place where people go to for relief. So efficiently that Pharaoh essentially allows Joseph to rule Egypt. When the people come to Pharaoh and say, we're, we're famished. Pharaoh says, go to Joseph. And whatever he tells you, do. The stage is set. What has been needed has been put into place. The incubator for Israel is ready. And we'll take a look at this as we continue on next week into chapter 42, um, how this plays out through the brothers of Joseph and the reunion that is coming. So again, as, as we look at this, what can we learn today, I guess, is the question. Well, the, the, the thing I want to re encourage you with is simply this. God has a plan. And you are part of it. I am part of it. And that plan is detailed down to the very day, down to the very dream, down to the very person, down to the very place, down to the very purpose. Never doubt your place in God's plan. If you are following God, you have a place. And sometimes, even if you're not following God, you have a place. Uh, Pharaoh was not following God. And even though he acknowledged the spirit of God within Joseph, don't think that Pharaoh was suddenly becoming a God worshiper. He was not. He still worshiped his gods, the pagan gods of Egypt. But that doesn't mean that God could not use him. 
and God did. God used Pharaoh to put Joseph in place where Joseph needed to be so that Israel could be provided a safe haven in the centuries to come so that it might develop into a people, a nation. That is God's purpose in all of this, and he has prepared it perfectly. So never doubt your place in God's plan. I don't know what God's plan is, okay? I don't presume to know that. I don't think Joseph could know exactly what God's plan was. Joseph, I think, in a lot of ways, was kind of going with the flow. He had faith in God to get him to where he needed to be at the right time and to give him the wisdom to say the words that needed to be said. So maybe it's that for the message for you today. Take a deep breath. Relax. Go with the flow. Let God be God. And you do what God tells you to do. When God tells you to do it. In the place God tells you to do it. Say the words to the person that needs to hear it. Play your part in God's plan. Father, we thank you for the day. Thank you, Lord, again, for your love for us, for your presence with us throughout each and every day, for your providence, your watch care over us. Lord, the direction of all the pieces on the board to put us in the right place at the right time in front of the right person with the right words to speak. Lord, we trust that that is exactly what you're going to do with us today. And we ask you, Father, to continue to do that. Give us strength. Give us courage to speak the words that you give to us that we might play the part in your plan that you have intended for us to play. And we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. Hope to see you next week.